That was the voice of Cindy James Killer. Like a good thriller, this case will have you scratching your head, questioning your own assumptions about who, if anyone, is telling the truth. The curiosity of the human mind, as true crime fans know, will have you seeing shapes in the dark, questioning people's motives, and reading intentions into the innocent actions of our fellows. But this little Canadian nurse suffered for seven years, was not believed by authorities, and ended up drugged, strangled, and hogtied in an abandoned lot in a Vancouver suburb. So which is worse? That she was a victim of a stalker with a dedicated long game, or of herself? We will compare the characteristics of this case to the better-known fictional depiction of skullduggery and manipulation in the 2012 novel Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. In hopes of clarifying what disorders might be common to these scenarios, and learn a little bit about the human mind as it relates to these lady liars. Novel Meets Evil is a true crime podcast where we compare literary characters from modern fiction to real cases to see what we can learn about human nature. You think you know your neighbors, your coworkers, your spouse, but the real creeps hide in plain sight every day. What's behind the curtain? What are they hiding? Do you really want to know? And why are you so eager to look? What are you hiding? I'm here to tell you that there's nothing wrong with looking. Just don't stare. It'll give you the creeps. Creep, 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 creep. Something that's always bugged me about unexplained cases. People are quick to interchange the words unexplained with unexplainable. If you're claiming that something can't be explained, then you are claiming to know something special about the case. And while it's true that nothing can be explained completely down to the neuron and the nanosecond, we can make models of what explanations best account for all the evidence. Gravity is the most reliable explanation we have for what we see in the natural world when we drop something when two large bodies get close to each other. As a species, we want to explain things. We find most compelling the stories with answers that are just out of reach. The scariest villains are the ones that are hard to see, hard to make out in the fog. Jaws was scary because you barely saw the shark, just enough to know that he's out there. They went out of their way not to show the monster, and the film was so much scarier for it. When you're only given a hint of something menacing, the threat is scarier than if you know exactly what you're dealing with. Humans fill in the blanks with the most threatening details. My dad kept his tools in the basement at our house growing up, and if I had to go to the basement to get something, I was in my own little horror movie. What if there's something down there I didn't see, but now it's walking right behind me? Ugh, now I have to climb the steps. The first step, I thought, I'm being ridiculous. The second step? Wait, did I hear something? Suddenly I'm skipping steps, feeling the cold hand of something terrible reaching to grab my shirt as I dive the last few steps up and into the kitchen, sliding across the floor. The menace got exponentially worse with each bound upward. The imagination is amazing and scary. In the town where I grew up, there was a peeping Tom. He was described as a tall, lanky man in workman's coveralls and had been seen walking, sometimes carrying a ladder late at night through our quiet streets past the darkened bedrooms of parents and kids. Several parents had individually witnessed the man sitting at the foot of their daughter's beds while watching them sleep. On the next block from my house, a teacher from my elementary school was stumbling bleary-eyed to the bathroom in the middle of the night and thought he saw a shadow on his daughter's floor. He pissed and then came back, and now, fully awake, sure enough, there was the shape standing slowly and turning to the front door. The teacher hollered at the man, who slowly, as if he didn't even see the teacher, ambled down the front steps and across the dark summer lawn. The teacher chased the man out of the yard and down the street, but couldn't keep up in his bare feet. The breaking and entering aspect was obviously disturbing, but as a kid, I always found it much scarier because the peeping Tom never actually attacked anyone, never even stole anything. He just watched the people as they slept. When the creep in question is hard to define, motives unclear, like our small town peeping Tom, 
like Jaws, they take on an even more menacing shape. The mind wanders much more, thinking of all the potentially horrible things that are surely about to happen, even if they never do. Our subject today is the victim of her own personal slasher film. Except unlike the lame Hollywood horror flicks, this one leaves you wondering. Even if you can nail down what you think happened, the questions remain. This is the story of Cindy James. We will be referencing interview clips from the show Unsolved Mysteries, the Cindy James episode 1991, and a segment from A Current Affair 1992. Growing up in Ottawa, Ontario, Cindy Hack had a normal upbringing. Her dad was a military man, and Cindy claimed he was strict and meted out corporal punishment, which wasn't abnormal for Canada in the 50s and 60s. She was a middle child of six siblings. All was well in the Hack household. As a late teen, Cindy left her family to try her hand at nursing school in Vancouver, British Columbia, which fit her people-pleasing nature and need to help others. In 1966, she graduated from nursing school with a BSN. For nine years, she worked at Vancouver General Hospital as a pediatric nurse. Then for 12 years, she worked at a home for troubled kids, where everyone said she was top-notch and a normal person. She got married to a psychiatrist named Roy Makepeace, who was almost twice her age, and her parents did not approve. They were divorced but stayed on good terms, even dating occasionally. It is at this point she begins living on her own for the first time in her life in Richmond, a Vancouver suburb. In 1982, Cindy started making reports to the police. She claimed to be the victim of stalking and torment by an unknown assailant. She described having received repeated threatening calls like the one at the top of this episode. She said it was just a voice. Sometimes it would change the sound, and sometimes it was just whispering. Sometimes it was just nothing, just silence. Scary copy-pasted letters saying things like, You're next. Pictures of dead bodies under medical sheets pinned to her car. The person knew her name. They used it when monster calling her. Cindy, dead meat, soon. Cindy kept her own records of the harassing calls, broken house lights, broken windows, and actual break-ins. It's all her word, of course. A Richmond cop by the name of McBride was convinced of her claims and tried to get a bigger police presence in her area, which she did get pushed through. But whenever cops were posted outside her house, the vandalism and the break-ins stopped. Hmm, that's peculiar. According to Vancouver Sun reporter Neil Hall, who wrote the book on Cindy James. They had 24-hour surveillance on her house for, like, days on end, with up to 14 officers. But never, when surveillance was on her house, never any, any event would happen. As soon as surveillance was taken off, of course, then she'd get another incident that happened. Her phone line was tapped, and when calls came in, they hung up too quickly to be traced. Interesting. Cindy's mother says, When the police were watching the house, we would say to them, well, you know, if it's somebody doing that, sure as heck he knows you're there. And of course, nobody will do anything while you're sitting there and watching. Eventually, the concerned cop moved into her house to help out, and soon afterward, they became romantically involved. He claimed to have received a number of weird calls while staying at the Richmond house. Many times, the phone lines were found to be cut. Cindy's ex, Roy, was still very concerned and would stop by every once in a while to shoot the breeze with housemate McBride, talking about the case. Both men were hooked on the story and wanted to nail the bastard ruining this poor woman's life. McBride, a divorcee, maybe he was really lonely when he abruptly asked Cindy to marry him. She said no. He moved out soon afterward, but remained interested in keeping her safe. Maybe not as invested as Roy, who was caught staking out Cindy's house to try and catch her attacker in the act. Roy hadn't told Cindy he was doing this, possibly because he knew she liked to put on a show when people were watching, and he wanted the straight dope on what was happening. So Cindy was not without support. 
In 1983, Cindy's friend Agnes came over to the house to find her strangled and passed out in the garage. I found her crunched down with a nylon tied tightly around her neck. Cindy said she'd gone out to the garage to get a box, and just as she got to the garage, she turned and uh, someone grabbed her from behind, she said, and uh, all she saw was white sneakers. The police questioned Cindy about this attack, during which she failed two lie detector tests. Lie detectors are pseudoscience, but at the time they were taken seriously as a tool. It's kind of interesting that she allowed herself to be tested at all. Another sign that she was either overconfident in her lying abilities, or maybe she had started to believe her own stories. Or maybe they were true. Her well thought out response to the polygraph results was that she had recognized one of the men, but refused to say who it was because they had threatened to hurt her family. <sighs> That's not completely unbelievable. Cindy told me that uh, uh, after she was attacked, the knife was held at her throat, and she was told that if you talk, your sister will be next, and then your mother. So just keep quiet, don't tell anything. Cindy hired a private investigator, this big Fred Flintstone head Canadian ex-cop Ozzy Caban, to find her tormentor, and even he began skeptical of her truthfulness. She wouldn't tell him the entire story. She would be evasive. Uh, she would uh, withhold information. And she simply would not act as a normal uh, victim would act. And I can see where uh, a, a police officer would have a tremendous amount of problem in believing her story. One of her goals throughout her life seemed to be to get people to believe her. Whether she was lying or not, and only she could know this. She seemed to place supreme value on people believing she was telling the truth. So Caban's skepticism stung her. He decided to give her a walkie-talkie to use. In case of emergency, just ping me and I'll be over as soon as possible. One night, he heard a struggle coming through the radio and he sped to her place. When he arrived, he found her almost dead, drugged and strangled outside. I went around the house and uh, the house was locked. I was able to look into the house through a window, and I found Cindy lying there. I Cindy. took a look at her, and I thought she was dead. There was a note that was pinned with a paring knife through her hand. When I interviewed Cindy, she told me that she noticed a man coming through the gate. Uh, the next thing she remembers is being hit on the side of the head with a piece of wood or something of that nature. Uh, she then remembered being held down on the floor, and she remembered a needle going into her arm. She had a knife stabbed through her hand with a note reading, Now you must die, cunt. Caban believed her after that. She even moved to a new house in Richmond and changed her name from Cynthia Makepeace to Cindy James. But it didn't seem to matter, as soon a note appeared at her house reading, Run, rabbit, run. I'll show you how fucking good I am. Soon, bang, bang, you're dead. Now, everything up to this point leads me to believe that she was a victim of someone, either herself or her stalker, and I feel immense empathy either way. But then comes the most disturbing detail to me up to this point. In October 1983, a year after the first call to the police, Cindy found three dead cats hanging from trees in her yard, one with a note tied to it that read, You're dead. Dead cats don't grow on trees, so who killed them? Didn't it have to be Cindy? Her previous lies, the letter, the possibly staged attacks were all disturbing, but no one but her was physically hurt. Now cats? That would be the moment where, as a friend, I'd ask myself again, which is worse, my friend is being harassed into an early grave by some creep, or that my friend is so mentally unwell and is both the victim and the perpetrator. As a family member, both scenarios are terrible, and I almost wouldn't care which one is true, especially if I can never know. But cats. Jesus. 
Cindy is a blurry picture, obviously. So I want to try and sharpen the image just a little bit here. Let's rewind for a second to two earlier incidents. When Cindy was in her late teens, she left her parents in Ottawa and moved to Vancouver. This was around the time her dad had decided to move the family to France. A young Cindy enrolled in nursing courses at university. Around this time, Cindy wanted to remain connected to her folks and told her family of an intern she'd met. And one thing led to another, and to her parents' surprise, they'd gotten engaged. However, unfortunately, he had developed a fatal form of cancer and died before they could ever make it official. None of the family ever met this man, and it is unclear whether he ever actually existed. But at this point, as a family member, you don't go investigating the veracity of such claims. It's a minor claim. After all, why would someone make that up? Hmm. Then, right before Cindy and Roy got married, Cindy sat Roy down and read him a letter from her parents in which they expressed disapproval and suspected Roy was taking advantage of the younger, more naive Cindy. Roy realized immediately she had written the letter herself. So she must have expected this transparent ploy to convince him, which indicates what? An overconfidence in her deceptive abilities? A disconnection from reality? And what would the ploy even have gotten her? Maybe she expected to play the diplomat between Roy and her parents, coming out looking like a peacemaker. He forgave her, but this was an early data point for his later suspicions about his soon-to-be wife's mental state. Roy would later suspect her of having multiple personality disorder. If you look at her, she's an unexpected candidate for a creep. A tiny, pretty Canadian lady who got her nursing degree and worked for many years to help people, including running a home for troubled youths. She cared about people. She wanted to diminish suffering in the world. She wanted to tell her family what was really happening, who she suspected, but she was too worried that it would put them in danger. Cindy's mom continues. The knife was held at her throat, and she was told that if you talk, your sister will be next, and then your mother. So just keep quiet. Don't tell anything. She would cry to them, with them, and the suffering was spread around for others to help her bear. Seven years after her divorce, at approximately 4 o'clock p.m., May 25th, 1989, Cindy picked up her paycheck from Richmond General Hospital, where her co-workers had known about her ongoing ordeal. She spoke with a co-worker on that day who said she seemed to be in good spirits when she told him she had been without incident at her home for at least two weeks. That was unusual. Cindy was seen several hours later purchasing groceries at a Safeway and then visiting a Bank of Montreal. A bank customer told police they had stood in line behind James at the bank's ATM where she deposited her paycheck at approximately 7.59 p.m. That same day, James had scheduled to have a high-tech security system installed at her house and had planned for her friends Agnes and Tom Woodcock to play bridge and spend the night. When they didn't hear from her, the Woodcocks showed up at her house approximately 10 p.m., where her Chevy Citation was nowhere to be seen. The Woodcocks drove past the Safeway shopping center, which they knew Cindy to frequent, and found her car abandoned in the lot. They contacted the Richmond RCMP to report James as a missing person. A patrol car was sent to investigate because they knew of her extensive history with the police department. Blood was located inside her car on the driver's side door, as well as groceries and a wrapped birthday gift for her friend's young son. Her wallet was found underneath the car. Police found her house orderly and clean, her house plants well tended. The Canadian Coast Guard started searching the nearby rivers. Several days after James was reported missing, her tenant told police that he had received a call at his office from a man claiming to be James's father, asking about her life insurance policy. The man's secretary told the caller he would need to visit the office. That information couldn't be given over the phone. When police asked James's father about this, he denied ever making such a call. On June 8, 1989, a workman on a road crew steps away from his job site to relieve himself in a nearby yard. He returns a moment later as white as a sheet. The hands were behind her back, strapped to her feet, strapped her tied feet. to her feet with a rope or a cord. 
he had stumbled upon the body of a young woman in some blackberry bushes who had been hogtied and strangled with something still around her neck. The body had been there long enough to gather flies, which the workers found odd because that left enough time for it to be seen easily from the road and should have been noticed by passersby. On a nearby building was graffiti reading, Some bitch died here. A line spray-painted along the ground with the same orange paint ran from a fuel tank to the spot where her body lay, encircling it. Inside the abandoned home, another spray-painted graffiti read, Devil. It was the late 80s, though. Sheila Carlyle, a pathologist who examined James's body at the scene, noted that her hands had been bound so tightly that one finger had scratched another down to the bone. A pinprick consistent with a hypodermic needle was located on the inner right elbow of the body. An autopsy determined that James had died of multiple drug intoxication from substantial amounts of morphine, diazepam, and fluorazepam. Her blood toxicology report showed that she had ten times the lethal dose of morphine in her bloodstream. The toxicologist also reported that James had orally ingested approximately 20 30 milligram tablets of fluorazepam, in addition to enough diazepam to be lethal to someone of her size. If she had received the morphine via injection, she would have been unconscious within minutes and dead within hours. Private investigator Ozzy Caban remained confident. There is no way that she could have been able, after ingesting that amount of drugs, to tie herself up. There was absolutely nothing at the crime scene to indicate that she had used any form of syringe or she had used any drinking device or anything of that nature. Again, Neil Hall. The morphine wouldn't have taken effect for, say, 15 minutes, half an hour. Uh, The knot specialist who came in and recreated the same type of knots and the way she was tied up, it took them three minutes. So basically, if she took the drugs at the same time, she would have had about 15 minutes in order to tie herself up. On the stand, Roy Makepeace made various accusations against James's family, alleging that her father had physically abused her throughout her childhood, and that one of her brothers had also molested her. It was also revealed that shortly after James's death, her parents found a stash of medications in her home, sedatives, antipsychotics, and more, that she had been prescribed by her psychiatrists, which they disposed of by flushing down the toilet. Dr. Paul Termanson testified that he believed James suffered from hysterical personality disorder, while Dr. Wesley Friesen, a longtime psychiatrist of James, stated he suspected she had borderline personality disorder with elements of post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr. Friesen said Cindy had tremendous amounts of rage toward her father, and based on their session together, he believed that it was a strong likelihood that her father sexually abused her when she was a child, though she had never made these claims herself. Cindy's psychiatrist says, And I saw her not just in conversational states, I saw her in deep hypnotic states as well. Uh, there was never any evidence that there, was another, there were other personalities there, so... The psychiatrists that were speculating about that were looking for an explanation for things that can't be explained and who can argue against uh, multiple personality disorder. The inquest concluded exactly one year after James had disappeared. The jury was unable to determine whether James's cause of death was suicide, homicide, or accidental. It was ultimately ruled that James had died of an unknown event, and the case was formally closed. Cynthia Elizabeth James, born June 12, 1944, died between June 2nd and June 8th, 1989. Her life was a thriller, and it ended no differently. She claimed to be on the receiving end of hundreds of acts of stalking, harassment, vandalism, home invasions, and physical attacks perpetrated by an unknown assailant. No one would claim to be part of a marginalized community and subject themselves to bullying and harassment if it weren't true. No one is going to choose the hard road. People say this like it's self-evident. And while it does seem like common sense to most of us, it doesn't account for the uncommon sense of a person with unseen problems. Unfortunately, there are people who feel they deserve to be treated badly for one reason or another. Self-hate, maybe. Battered spouses go back to their abusers. 
It's unfortunate that the wires are crossed in someone's head and it leads them to this, but it happens. In the case of Richmond, British Columbia nurse Cindy James, many people said no one would subject themselves to that kind of torture on purpose. It makes no sense that she would commit these acts of abuse and suffering on herself for all these years. For what? But suicide is still the most believed scenario. Let me be clear, she is a victim any way you slice it and deserves all the empathy in the world. What scares me the most about this case? Well, just like the peeping Tom of my childhood, it's unclear why someone commits such acts. I'm forced to draw the eeriest assumptions based on my own insecurities. Those are the scariest stories. We know she had been spinning fantasies around herself since early adulthood, probably earlier, without obvious motives. While many of the lies were innocent, in retrospect, some may be seen as indicative of a growing problem. Of course, no one could have known how deep the problem would become. So I'm left wondering about things people hide from each other. Most of us are not hiding anything truly horrible from friends and family, but out in public, most of us knowingly create an external persona to show others. Yeah, it's a little ingenuine, but you can't show everyone everything. We avoid using bad language at work. We play politically neutral to fit in with our coworkers. Are we hiding things about ourselves because we're planning on doing something horrible? I don't think so. I think we hide things we worry others would misunderstand. But we don't always know which of our own issues people will and will not understand. We have to be open with people if we want to connect and be part of the human race. So which do you find scarier? If Cindy James' claims of being stalked and attacked for years are true, or if she'd been doing it to herself the whole time. I worked at a library when the book Gone Girl was really big in 2012, 2013, when it first came out. I couldn't help but notice the similarity between this scenario in Gone Girl with the real-life case of Lacey Peterson's disappearance and what would later be revealed as her murder at the hands of her scumbag husband, Scott. I don't want to get deeply into that case right now, but the similarities are pretty obvious. For now, we will reference the novel, which veers off from the Peterson case pretty extremely at a certain point. Nick and Amy Dunn dated for two years and then got married. They lived happily together as writers in a Brooklyn brownstone. Amy wasn't a proper writer as she created personality quizzes for magazines and newspapers. However, the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009 left them out of work. Amy had been the subject of her parents' children's book series, Amazing Amy, which allowed her to grow up in money. The series declined in sales, but Amy's parents spent money like things were still great, which brought them into debt. With these problems, they asked Amy for money from her trust fund, which pissed off Nick. Nick's mother fell ill, and the couple moved to his hometown of Carthage, Missouri, to take care of her. With permission, Nick uses Amy's trust fund to open a bar in town with his twin sister, Margot. Nick also teaches journalism at a local college. Amy hates that Nick dragged her to live in the suburbs, isolated from the life she really wanted. Her diary begins painting a picture of Nick as an aggressive, moody, loafing loser, and she's often afraid of him. From his point of view, we learn that he sees her as basically a ball and chain. But they are both unreliable narrators in this book. Nick has been secretly dating a former student, Andy. Amy had found out and, in usual fashion, felt betrayed because she had invested so much of herself into becoming the cool chick Nick wanted and felt that all the work she had done on this facade was underappreciated. She was clearly a victim of his indiscretions, but she chose to be offended at the wrong thing. If you've been cheated on, that's what you're angry at. Your partner has betrayed the trust that you've established. But Amy was mad that all of the masterful manipulative effort she'd put into becoming a new kind of Amy wasn't valued. What about all the work I put into this? What, the relationship? No, the appearance of the relationship. That's hard work for a psychopath. 
Nick was planning on divorcing Amy, but then she goes missing, and he's actually concerned. Amy, now in present tense, reveals that she is still alive, having staged her disappearance, to go into hiding for fear of Nick. She learned of his affair and began planning a complex, faked death and getaway. She framed Nick out of revenge for his wasting of her life. Her pregnancy had been fake. Her diary entries were carefully curated to incriminate Nick. Amy uses their yearly anniversary scavenger hunt to leave clues. You see, she had bought a bunch of expensive things she stashed in Margot's shed, including a pair of Punch and Judy puppets as an anniversary gift, one missing a handle. Now in hiding, Amy assumes she can sit back and watch the whole ordeal while holed up at a remote hotel with a pile of cash and then drown herself in the Gulf of Mexico as the last nail in Nick's coffin. That's some plan. But you see, she is robbed at the hotel and now has nothing, no means of funding her hideout. So Amy goes on to a plan B. She contacts an old flame from her youth, the well-to-do Desi, with whom she has a complex history of manipulation. He lets her hide in his lake house, but becomes possessive and overbearing. She feels trapped. It's around this time that Nick goes on TV, as planned by his lawyer, in order to humanize his image in the public. He admits to wrongdoing and says he's sorry about the cheating and dishonesty. Amy, having seen and been impressed by the TV interview, hearing him admit that he was wrong and she was innocent, decides that she and Nick actually do understand each other and should be together. Then the police discover the shed of purchased items, including the Punch and Judy dolls. They find the missing puppet's handle covered in Amy's blood. At this time, she decides to make it seem like Desi had been holding her hostage by staging injuries consistent with rape. She seduces and murders Desi, making it look like self-defense. She's just a victim. Amy returns to North Carthage with her story, and although Margot, Nick, and the lead detective think she is lying, they can't prove it. Public pressure is such that Nick is basically forced to take her back so it won't look bad. Amy's diaries resume, detailing her misunderstood ordeal with her as the victim. But Nick secretly writes his own tell-all book about Amy's lies. Then Amy, brilliantly, impregnates herself with Nick's stored semen from a fertility clinic, and she forces Nick to delete his book over penalty of never being allowed to see their child blackmailed into complying, Nick dedicates himself to the phony role of good husband and dad. It seems that the image of the perfect couple is just as good as the real thing for Amy. If she can't be seen as the perfect wife, then her second choice seems to be arranging herself in the role of poor innocent victim. So what can we learn from the personality of a fictional character like Amy? Well, you see, even though they're both lady liars, Amy is a psychopath. Cindy James is just psychotic. So what is a psychopath, a sociopath? And how does this relate to Cindy James and Gone Girl's character, Amy? Now I will, as quickly and as dumbed down for myself as possible, try to draw some distinctions between psychopathy antisocial personality disorder, and sociopathy, which are commonly confused, but are not the same things. The psychopath is compelled to engage in violating norms without caring, and as such is more active. The psychopath is more dangerous, committing observable violations and crimes in the real world. You'll tend to see antisocial behavior, lack of empathy and remorse, disinhibition and impulsivity, this is key by the way, and overblown sense of self. The sociopath is more passive, less dangerous in the sense that they only have affective deficits, particularly not knowing right from wrong and not understanding the bounds of social norms. 
they're not driven to violate rules and expectations. The terms psychopathy and sociopathy aren't really used as diagnoses anymore. The medical field prefers the terms antisocial personality disorder, ASPD, and dissocial personality disorder, DPD, respectively. And even though they're no longer used by psychiatric or psychological organizations, references to psychopathic traits are alive and well in the criminal justice world. The general public, popular press, and media still frequently use these terms along with crazy, insane, and mentally ill, synonymously. People will also say things like, this guy's psychotic, as if it's the same thing as calling someone a psychopath. It's an easy mistake to make. The words are practically the same thing, but they're not. Psychosis is a thing, and it has nothing to do with the identifiers we see of psychopathy. That lack of understanding and empathy for other people, not caring if others are harmed in order to benefit yourself. Rather, psychosis is when someone has difficulty determining what is real and what is not real. It often includes delusions and hallucinations, incoherent speech and behavior that is inappropriate for the given situation. Like the guy at the subway station screaming at the garbage can. You will also see sleep problems, social withdrawal, lack of motivation, and difficulty carrying out daily activities. You can experience temporary psychosis and get better with therapy. Unfortunately, ASPD and DPD seem to be baked in. They are part of who you are, and you'll have to basically deal with that for the rest of your life. Not to say that it can't be improved, but you can come out of psychosis. Let me give a personal example. Psychosis. It sounds like something scary that other people will have to deal with, and luckily, we will not. We dodged a bullet. Because now men are allowed to express emotion and admit to weaknesses, I'll tell you about my own experience of depressive psychosis that came on due to lack of sleep and severe depression. The best way I can illustrate it is with a couple of anecdotes. Bear with me here. If you have mental illness in the family, you may recognize some of this from your own life. In college, I had nothing better to do than to hang out at the hippie food co-op located in the student union, where I discovered also a periodic blood drive. So while ogling girls with dreads and patchouli, I would give blood. Part of the procedure the technician explained was a standard blood test for different STDs and other diseases. Cool, whatever. Well, around this time, I stopped sleeping. This accumulated and began breaking me down, and eventually I sat at the bottom of a well in this life-sucking depression. Nothing mattered. All the color was drained out of daily life, and I began experiencing depressive psychosis, essentially delusions, beliefs that were not grounded in reality but felt very real. I remember one day I was sitting on the floor of my group house, and I got a phone call on the landline. It was my mom. She kind of knew what was going on with my health and was worried about me. She asked what I was doing. I said I wasn't doing anything. And she said, well, walk me through what you are doing. Just anything. Put it into words. She was just trying to get me talking. So I said I was trying to clean my room, and I had papers and lyric sheets and shit all over my floor. I pulled out a piece of opened mail from the Red Cross. I told her I vaguely remembered getting this about a week or two ago. It was the result of some blood tests following my giving blood. She said, oh, okay, what were the results? And I said, the sheet says HIV-A test positive. HIV-B test also positive. Mom was speechless for a second. She said, wait, you got that a week ago and you didn't say anything? I said, I remember reading it and then chuckling and throwing it on my bed. Somehow it fell on the floor and that was that. I said, there wasn't much I can do anyway and it's probably for the best. 
Well, of course, she was very upset and begged me to get retested at a medical clinic. At that time, I was working at this uh, artsy foreign film store in D.C., and I would ride my bike from College Park, Maryland, down to Adams Morgan in D.C., and on my way, I had seen a health clinic down there called the Whitman Walker Clinic. I guess I could leave early one day and go to the clinic for another test. My mom said, yes, I should do this, so I did. Now, it was 1998 or 99, so the tests took a couple of weeks to process. During these weeks, my parents were on pins and needles, waiting for the results. I forgot all about the test until I got this call saying that I could come in and sit with a counselor to review my results. I sat in the waiting room with a bunch of nervously sweating guys and gals until my code number was called. It was all anonymous, obviously. So the counselor read the results, and they came back negative on all HIV strains. The counselor asked if I had any questions if these were the results I was expecting. I said I wasn't expecting anything, really, but my mom would be happy. I called her afterward, and she tearfully thanked me, her baby boy. Now, obviously, when I think about it now, it's a very disturbing and sad image. Mom talking to her youngest son, who tells her he is not dying and clearly doesn't care. And she's upset, but she can't show him she's upset. So she just says thank you and hangs up and probably starts sobbing. So I got back on my bike and went to work. This is the story I use to describe the extent to which a depressive episode can take over, to make it seem like this is how things are from now on. Deal with it. Right around this time, another student in one of my classes pulled me aside after class to express concern. He'd seen me on multiple occasions walking into busy Baltimore Avenue traffic in College Park with no care for the cars coming toward me. I tried to explain to her that I had figured out a system, that they couldn't hit me. Traffic will adjust to me. It's all been worked out. Another thing I remember from this little snapshot of life was watching the ball drop on TV, marking the passage from 1999 to 2000. The image was all warped and warbly and distorted because I was viewing it through tears crying at the thought of another day, let alone another year. And that's how I remember it, bent and warped through a prism of tears. This destruction of myself kind of destroyed my ability to see myself in the future. I literally couldn't picture myself doing anything in the future. I wasn't suicidal, but I was convinced I knew that I would be dead soon. It was just a matter of when and how. I pictured a gargoyle falling from a skyscraper and smashing me like a bug. Or maybe my heart would just stop. I lay in bed often listening to my heart, expecting to just hear it stop and everything fade out. It's part of why I have so much trouble setting goals and planning now. The part of me that saw myself doing things in the future was like a hand seared on a hot stove, damaged for future use. Now, all of this is, as described above, crazy, insane, and mentally ill. But at least I wasn't psychopathic. This I could come back from. And I did. I use these examples to show that mental illness can creep up on you, especially if you're predisposed to it like I am. And you can lose touch with your previously normal sense of self-preservation. After a lot of therapy and support, you can climb out of that hole, as impossible as it seems at the time. I have only experienced aftershocks of this over the years. As hard as it is for me to believe it now, All these crazy thoughts made sense to me at one point, and that was because of psychosis. Here's a helpful hint. Don't go weeks without sleeping. Talk to your doctor. Experiences like this makes it easier for me to believe that people like Cindy James may really believe the stories they're telling. 
it's delusional, and it's just as convincing as reality. So, theories on Cindy James. Theory one, Cindy knew she was lying, that she staged the whole seven years of attack on herself for reasons unknown. We know this is possible. She had been caught lying before, and the police and public still believe this. This also explains the most evidence. Theory two, delusional. She was delusional and really thought she was being stalked and attacked. If those whispering, threatening voices on her voicemail were really her, then the only way she could make sense of all of this in one brain would be if she had multiple personality disorder, DID. Theory three, attacked. This theory says Cindy was the victim of an outside attacker. The lack of evidence where there should have been evidence implies this is almost impossible. There are anomalies at the scene of her death, true. Things we would expect to see but don't. However, there are always anomalies in everything that happens. At this point, the only people who believe this are family and friends. And who can blame them? I guess it's better than thinking she was crazy all those years. I think that one of the defense mechanisms that people have is denial. And I think it must be very hard for them to believe that, you know, they were taken into the, drawn into this whole thing year after year after year, and that it was all delusional. And you can feel sympathy for the family and friends and colleagues who were all close to her and trying to help her and protect her, and well, they went through hell themselves. Regardless of where you fall on these theories, Cindy knew right from wrong. She cared for people outside of herself. If she was experiencing cycles of delusion and didn't know that her stories were false, she still understood social norms. Like all good books, Gone Girl isn't just a story about Amy and Nick. It's based in something that actually happens, just dramatized. People screw over others to get what they want in the real world, human cost be damned. This happens all the time. Of course, it's not usually as dramatic as Gone Girl. Think about some of the people you know. Some of them would be fine asking, why shouldn't I run that red light? Why shouldn't I fire these employees to increase my bonus? Why shouldn't I just take what I want? A sociopath doesn't understand that violating these common mores that cause harm is wrong. A psychopath, like Amy, sees no reason not to do what's best for her. Amy isn't delusional about her claims of abuse at the hands of her husband and her ex-lover, but it doesn't compute that hurting Nick, Margot, or other family members isn't worth whatever harm it might cost. She isn't concerned with anyone's lives she may ruin in the process of telling her tall tales. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a psychopath. Over the nearly seven-year period Cindy James reported disturbing incidents, the RCMP allocated an estimated $1 to $1.5 million in funds to investigate her claims, marking one of the longest and most costly police investigations in British Columbia history. If this case creeps you out as much as it does me, you should totally check out this movie called The Night Listener. Tony Collette, Robin Williams, and I don't remember which one of the Culkin brothers it was, but it was one of them. Doesn't really matter. They're all the same. Just kidding. Don't go don't weeks go, without, go, without go, sleeping. Go, 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 go. Talk to your doctor. Don't be scared. Subscribe to season one for free in your podcast app. Then, be scared. 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 Scared.